Okay, we're talking about health in this country. The NHS waiting list for treatments has hit 7 million people for the first time ever, as A&E trolleys, uh, trolley waits also hit a record high. New data from NHS England shows there were 7 million people waiting to start routine hospital treatment at the end of August. They've claimed delays in discharging patients into the community and social care is affecting how many free beds are available with only an average of 40% of patients discharged when they were ready in September. So what's the solution to growing waiting times? Could recruiting internationally be the for- way forward? Well, earlier I spoke to Dr Matt Neal, the junior a and doctor, and Dr Adrian Boyle, vice president of the Royal College of Emergency Medicine. I started by asking Matt what it's like on the front line of the health service. I mean, it's immensely difficult, and I'm sure Adrian will touch on this more as an uh, A&E consultant, but it's, it's very difficult as a junior, and I'm sure as a senior, just to, to see things deteriorating the way they are uh, and being relatively helpless, really, in terms of what we can do about it. I think when you go back, we have to initially think about how we got to this position. Uh, and I think when you look at it in, in any sort of depth, it's really just chronic underfunding, chronic understaffing and underpayment of staff. Um, COVID-19 definitely definitely did not help in any in any sense obviously um but actually some of the core issues have been running much longer than that i think it was just really we were running quite close to maximum after a you know a good decade of so of austerity and had immense pressure on the system already uh, and that was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back um at the moment i, I think really for, for staff across the board not just doctors but the, the biggest issue is pay and that's why we're seeing a huge number of staff dropping out of the system um, you've seen the nurses balloting this week for industrial action. It's very likely that junior doctors will um, follow suit in January. Um, and really, when you when you look at this, it all comes down to whether staff feel valued. And that's not just about pay, but it's about working conditions as well. So when it comes to your role working in a hospital, what do you see? How have things deteriorated? What would it take to bring things back to a level that's tolerable and then something that you can build on and deliver the kind of service that you came into the health service to give your patients? I mean, it's so rich because there's, there's so many different avenues to attack, aren't there? I think when you think about it as a junior doctor in hospital, so for example, in A&E, you know, when I, when I started training and, and things like that, you'd see that there's relatively little in terms of things like corridor waits and uh, people waiting in the waiting room for, you know, eight to 10 hours. That used to be a very, very rare occasion, apart from maybe at the peak of winter, whereas now it's, a, it's literally a daily occurrence. Uh, you see the point where people are allocated to be on corridor. So it's literally corridor medicine and in some cases waiting room medicine, which really is not appropriate, but it's where we are. Um, and it's, it's just not acceptable, really. Uh, all we can do is really apologise to people for that. But at the same time, we're helpless to, to really improve that on a personal level. Uh, the, the answers need to come from above. It needs to come in terms of funding, in terms of staffing, in terms of payments, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, as I say, I'm sure Adrian will have some comments on that himself. Well, yes. Um, I mean, Matt, you've kicked it upstairs. You said the answers will come from above, including perhaps Dr. Adrian Boyle, VP of the Royal College of Emergency Medicine. Um, what answers do you have? Um, you can put pressure on the government, on the Department of Health. Um, and it's pretty crucial, isn't it? Because I see that the British Medical Association has said the NHS is at breaking point and um, there's a poll out today which says that 44% of hospital consultants, so guys at your level um, in England, plan to leave or take a break from working in the NHS over the next year. So things are going to get worse. Yes. Um, So the situation is pretty grim at the moment, Um, but it has got grim quite quickly. And I think it's important that we understand that this is not inevitable. So it's... um, you know, the media love a emergency pressures uh, or an A&E crisis type story, and they we provided a number of those over time. But actually, it's gone bad relatively quickly. And if we look back to 2015, 12 hour stays in emergency departments were almost unheard of. 12, a 12 hour stay in an emergency department triggered a whole bunch of action senior, senior people. We're now heading this year to over a million people spending more than 12 hours in an emergency department. So but the fact that we've gone from gone bad that quickly, I think is really concerning. But it also means that there's an opportunity for improvement. Now, the first step in trying to improve matters is that there actually we need our government to acknowledge there is a crisis and um, sort of old fashioned typeface, something must be done. And we're very happy to tell people what that something is. And in a way, if you are, are you to... suggesting, uh, Adrian, that 
Therese Coffey, the new health secretary, um, and her colleagues around the cabinet table don't know? Uh, I think they look at this um, with a degree of anxiety and uncertainty about what to do, um, because the problem looks so huge and so massive. Um, I think everyone is cited on the fact that the problems are around are most visibly manifested in Hamlin Sis. But the way we have to try and fix this is to think of this across the whole system. So the way to fix the ambulance problem and the big problem with the ambulance is that ambulances aren't able to hand over their patients, so they get stuck outside harming two people. One, the person inside the ambulance who doesn't get off low, uh, who doesn't get their care they need, but more importantly, the person who's waiting for that ambulance. The solution for that is not necessarily improving the ambulance service, it's improving what goes on in the emergency department. If you go into an emergency department now, I can guarantee it will feel really crowded, really busy, and probably quite unsafe with people being treated in areas which you wouldn't expect to be treated. Fixing the emergency department is actually not putting lots and lots of investment into the emergency department, it's actually making sure the hospital works better. So, And that means making sure you have enough beds. We run our hospitals with less beds than almost any other European country. And the winter plan that we were all given this year said we need 7,000 extra beds in the NHS in England England, just to cope with this winter. The figures we've seen today show there's been no real increase in the number of beds that we need. Now, every time these numbers come out about beds, the people throw their hands up in the air and say, where are we going to get the staff? Yep. And that goes back a lot to Matt's point. We're losing staff because they don't working conditions are pretty tough. People who want to stay are being found that they can get better deals elsewhere. And this goes right through the hospital and towards the final bit of the picture, which is actually how you get people out of hospital at the end. Now, we have probably about 10,000 people in our hospitals at the moment who can't leave but are medically fit for discharge. And that's because the interface between hospitals and uh, the social care sector, it just isn't working. And that's because actually we don't pay people who work in social care enough. This if is they, um, at the core of the problem, isn't it, Adrian and Matt? And uh, it's, not the, only, it's not the only fix. It, I know it's not the it, only thing, but you it, need... And it's the cheapest and quickest and easiest bit to fix. Yes, because for all of these... Um, the, the, the equipment and the new uh, treatment centres, polyclinics and etc. that the government and others are so proud of, in the end you need human beings, you know, short of uh, advanced robots, we need human beings to run these things and to treat people and to give that care. And I'm just reminded of the figures that came out a couple of months ago in August, which found that the NHS in England is increasingly reliant on doctors and nurses recruited from outside the UK and the EU. Think about the figures, you'll be aware of them, uh, Matt. 34% of doctors who joined the health service last year came from overseas, a rise from 18% um, eight years ago, and it's getting higher and higher. And a lot of these people are coming from developing countries, from, from Nigeria, from Zimbabwe, from the Philippines, from India. And there's an ethical consideration, isn't there, over how far we can raid if I can put it that way, doctors and nurses and medical workers from countries where the ratio of patient or to nurse or doctor is far worse than it is here. Matt, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I agree. So for a start, I don't think we'll ever reduce this backlog in any meaningful amount of time, really, with the con- continued exodus of staff. So on the one hand, I can understand the temptation to to apply the short-term fix in a way and, and bring staff from abroad. I think it's we need to be careful where we're bringing those staff from. And I think there are guidance on that. You know, if you... Look at the uh, official WHO guidance as a red list of countries where we shouldn't be taking um, healthcare staff from. And that's for that exact reason that you've, you've mentioned, you know, the so-called kind of brain drain of those nations where they've, they've applied their own training to make their own doctors and nurses, and then we're just bringing them over here for better pay. Uh, but conversely, uh, those people want to come here and they want to work here. So it, it's a fine balance. Um, but I think we need to be more careful about where we are potentially employing from. Uh, there was a news like uh, investigation wasn't there, this week which covered that exact same thing really. It was talked about um the recruitment from from Nigeria, which is actually on the on the red list at the moment. Well yes, um, I mean and I saw uh, the reporting on that and it's shocking the treatment that um those doctors from Nigeria say they've experienced. So the kinds of conditions and the terms that you know UK born or raised doctors 
would never put up with, certainly without uh, fuss. Um, well, it's been visited upon these uh, doctors and it could lead to all kinds of pressures and indeed mistakes. Oh, absolutely. It's almost slave-like behaviour, really, the way they, they were treated when they were brought over working kind of seven-day uh, week on calls, potentially even falling straight into another week of on calls. Um, the other issue is really that I've described it as a short-term fix, but actually it's not. When you have new staff coming into a new system, the, the time it takes to become familiar with the system and to become competent within it um, is a significant amount of time, actually. It's, it's not a, you know, a one-week training system where you set them up uh, and they're, they're ready to go. It does take a good number of weeks and months to, to become familiar with how things work. Um, so that's, that's definitely one consideration. Yeah. Uh, Adrian, yeah. what are your thoughts on this, particularly this notion that if we are ethical and we don't start raiding other uh, countries that are on the red list, countries that can ill afford an exodus of their own skilled health workers, what do we do then? So it is. this is a, a surprisingly complicated and nuanced issue. Um, so at one stage we'll have what we, um, the, on a simplistic level, you can say taking doctors from a, and nurses from a poor country is clearly the wrong thing to do. However, there are, um, we have seen that there are countries that actually produce and train lots of people, but then aren't able to provide the actual posts for them. So you end up in uh, some countries, particularly, uh, and a good example of this is Nepal, where they trained lots and lots of nurses, but then weren't able to fund places for them to work in their public hospitals. So in a way, coming over to the UK, it's some sort of mitigation for this. Economically, I think it's actually a really short term thing to do, because a lot of people who come from very poor countries who come to work in the UK, the money that gets spent by our whole health economy on them doesn't trickle down into our into our community uh, afterwards. It, what happens is a lot of that money will go back to the other countries. I wish we weren't in, actually in this situation and we were actually training enough of our own staff. Medicine is an incredibly popular degree. It's very hard to get in. There's a lot of people this summer who've been disappointed, who would have been who would have made very good doctors who couldn't get into a medical school in this country. We've got lots of people who want to do this. We've had a small increase in the number of medical student places, and yet we still seem to be unable to train enough people to do it. So is there's no shortage of willing. Uh, Matt, if you knew when you were a student uh, deciding what to do at 18 that um, the reality of life as an A&E doctor, as a hospital doctor, would be as grim as it's turned out to be. Would you have told your 18-year-old self to do something else? <laughs> so, I mean, I actually came into it later. I'm a graduate entrant. But okay. I think going, even going back to before I came to med school, and it was a relatively short time ago, it was kind of, what, seven, eight years ago now. But I think actually I would have reevaluated where I studied and potentially where I would have worked, actually, because unfortunately I, I know COVID has made things worse and probably not a realistic uh, example of what life would have been without it. Um but actually, I, I think the quality of life abroad is, is much better. If you look at people who are going to Australia, New Zealand, those sort of places, uh, frankly, having a much better time. And that's part of the reason why we're struggling to fill training spots for specialist training. People are going abroad, realising that actually potentially there's a better life away from the NHS. So, Dr. Boyle, uh, finally, what would you say to Therese Coffey, the health secretary, who says she doesn't want a nanny people? And um, she is a member of a cabinet and a government that doesn't want to be too big. It wants to pull back and allow people to get on with the things themselves. What would you say to her? Um, she has a, a responsibility as the Secretary of State of Health for the standards and what has been delivered to the public. And I think she, um, I would say that she, you know, you need, she needs to take these responsibilities seriously because this is killing people. Um, the pressure we're under now, whether it's the delay or dilution or the long waiting lists or the poor access to care, is a is making this, the health service unsafe. And she is ultimately responsible for that. So I'd like her to feel the responsibility that we feel that we carry every time we go into, into a clinical area. I go into a situation now, every time I go into a cubicle, the first thing I have to do is apologise whether it be the environment I'm looking after somebody in or the weight and the inordinate amount of hurdles they've had to get to see me. I'm sure we are a highly developed country for very capable people. We have no shortage of uh, ability and know-how in this country. 
we're actually a, a wealthy, well-organised country. We should be able to do much better than we're doing at the yeah. moment. And that was Dr Jimmy Whitworth, physician specialising in infectious diseases at the London School. Oh, that's me messing about. Sorry about that. Let me just uh, wind back a second because that was a debate that we just had with Dr Matt Neal, junior A&E doctor, and Dr Adrian Boyle, vice president of the Royal College of Emergency Medicine. Uh, 